Uh, good evening, everybody, uh, and welcome to this year's annual Environmental Humanities Initiative Distinguished Lecture, Paradise Lost. The first of a three-part uh, a, a three lecture series, How the Humanities Can Save the Planet, to be delivered by Sir Jonathan Bate across the next six weeks. I'm Mark Lucier, Professor of English, Senior Sustainability Scholar in GEOS, and Acting Director of the EHI program this semester. My colleague, Joni Adamson, who directs both the EHI and the North American Observatory for the International Humanities for the Environment program, would normally serve in this capacity, but could not attend due to her selection as the Benjamin N. Duke Fellow at the National Humanities Center, although she sends her warmest uh, regards and heartfelt thanks for your variegated support for the initiative. The EHI was inaugurated, uh, strangely enough, in 2005 with the last appearance of, at ASU of Professor Bate and the visit of Professor Mary Evelyn Tucker, co-founder and co-director of the Forum for Religion and Ecology at Yale University. Across its brief existence, the EHI has created an undergraduate environmental humanities certificate held national and international conferences and workshops, made connections that stretch across the world, and emerged as a leading program in the field, a result of Johnny's tireless efforts and the collective efforts of so many of you in the room this evening. Immediate thanks to Lauren Kuby, Kristen LaRue Sandler, and Bruce Matsunaga, for their relentless labor, and of course, all three of them had an opportunity to talk me down in the last week or so, so this is good. Uh, but not just for their work on this program, but as you all know, both for this program and their daily labors for all of us. I also want to acknowledge the crucial support of those who helped gather the funding to support Professor Bates' residency at ASU for what we would term Spring A 2019, basically January and February, during her service as Interim Director of Humanities, Elizabeth Langlin immediately offered the resources and support of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences and continued that support as she moved into the directorship of the Institute for Humanities Research. Upon his assumption of duties as the new Humanities Dean, Jeffrey Kahn continued, uh, a, a offered, a, a Jeffrey offered to continue college support and of course, no surprise, such a sport begins at the top with Dean Patrick Kinney, uh, with his backing and encouragement. He enabled this program and so much more. Given that Jonathan and I are team teaching environmental film, literature, and theory through the English department, never what one would call a moneymaker in our budgetary model around the humanities, <laughs> I think. Uh, our exemplary chair, Krista Ratcliffe, not only approved the chorus, Chris offered monetary support that came at a crucial time. And I will say deep thanks to all of you. It's an honor to know and work with you. Of course, without the enthusiastic support of Dr. Gary Dirks, who directs the Julianne Wrigley Global Institute of Sustainability, the next six weeks would not have been possible. Tonight, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Gary, who will then introduce our distinguished speaker. And Gary, the form of my thanks is to keep it short as you prefer. <laughs> the last conversation we had. Uh, uh, in the wake of completing his doctorate in chemistry at ASU in 1980, Gary's work on photosynthesis and biofuels brought immediate recognition and launched a professional career that led to heights uh, as high as his appointment to as president of British Petroleum Asia Pacific and president of BP China. From this global post and with this expansive view, he returned to ASU under, uh, to undertake work on, to save the planet, as I've often heard him say. Within the Julianne Wrigley School of Sustainability, Gary wears many hats. Distinguished sustainability science, uh, scientist, director of Lightworks, Julianne Wrigley Chair in Sustainability, 
and his work established GEOS as a hub of transdisciplinary activities and cross-campus collaborations, thereby serving as a sort of galvanizing uh, uh, presence uh, that galvanized individuals, units across the university, the state, the country, and the world. Gary inspires such efforts because he sees deeply into the heart of things, to borrow a line from William Wordsworth, and remains dedicated uh, to bringing every possible resource to bear on the current condition, well, crisis. In our first meeting, after reviewing uh, data about our growing global dangers, he said, to my surprise, you know, Mark, only the humanities can save the planet now a position that stands behind and motivates the lectures, uh, the inaugural lecture this uh, evening. His vision is shared as a shared one that brings us together this evening. Thank you for such sentiments and the support you offer to those things inaugurated tonight. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Gary Dirks. Thank you, Mark, and let me add my thanks and welcome to all of you for joining us here this evening. Uh, it is a great pleasure for us to be able to hold events like this, and it's a rare honor that we're able to um, have someone like Sir Jonathan Bates come and provide a lecture to the, uh, groups like this. I think it's probably fair to say that every generation feels like they face extraordinary and unprecedented circumstances to one degree or another. And at the risk of perpetuating that sentiment, I do think it's probably fair to say that what lies ahead of us now is truly unprecedented. Uh, my personal view is that if you look at the big systems, both human and natural, upon which we depend for our existence, uh, energy, food, water, finance, trade, rivers, the quality of our, our air, the quality of the land, all of our natural systems, it's unlikely that in the trajectory that we're on, they will be robust about, against what comes in the middle of this century when we have 10 billion people on the planet. We're facing, in my view, an unprecedented transformation, both in terms of scope and scale. In the industry that I know best, and one of the big human systems upon which we depend, the energy system, we're facing the reality of tearing down one system in its entirety, eliminating all fossil carbon, and building in lockstep a new one. A hundred trillion dollars is probably about the scale that we're talking about. And that's just the energy system alone. Mark said earlier that in remarks I've made to him and to others that it's going to be humanities that has to lead us out of this. And that is absolutely what I believe. Humanities and social scientists now need to be in the front, not brought in early. I say this to my colleagues often. Don't come to me and say, please bring us into your projects early so that we can have an impact on them. No, not early. Start the project. You lead. Then we'll bring in economists. We'll bring in the business people. We'll bring in the engineers and scientists. I believe this is essential because we have to have fundamentally different narratives and we have to revisit relationships in a way that has been systematically degraded over the last 200 years. And I think it's the integrated insights and the ability to think in terms of narrative and relationship that humanities and social sciences bring us and that will be essential for us to deal with what lies ahead. We are indeed tremendously fortunate to have Sir Jonathan join us tonight. Uh, he was here, I think, two years ago, Jonathan, about two three. years ago, about three years ago. And it was the first time I'd had a chance to meet him. I had dinner with him at Trix. And I think we could have gone all through the night, talking about what needs to be done and the extraordinary things that, that humanities and the insights that he had could add. And his record is, in fact, extraordinary. It's, it's literally four pages of really, truly 
outstanding achievements. Uh, he's solo authored uh, 12 books. He's uh, been a significant editor and contributor to like 40 books. Um, he was uh, an, one of the few people who have ever received a knighthood uh, for contributions to scholar, li, scholarly literary work. Um, excuse me, I just dropped that. Um, he, he, I wanted to get here the, the fellow of the British Academy at age 40. For those of you that are familiar with the British Academy, this isn't a place you get into until you have gray hair. <laughs> and Jonathan was a member at 40. And the list goes on and on, uh, including some very substantial ability to sell his message to a mixed audience and raise money to support the humanities and, to port, and, and in particular to support environmental humanities. So we have a rare opportunity to be uh, hosting Sir Jonathan and Lady Paula, who, by the way, is a very accomplished scholar in her own right. Uh, and this is, as, as uh, Mark already mentioned, is the first of three lectures. So without any further ado, Jonathan, thank you so much for being here. And we look forward to the first of three. <laughs> so first of all, just to add my thanks um, to the many parts of the university that have come together to, to make this residency possible. On behalf of Paul and myself, we're incredibly grateful and incredibly excited to be at this amazingly innovative university in this rather extraordinary environment of Phoenix. And particular thanks uh, to Marc Lucier and Gary Dirks, who have been the two master spirits behind the visit. So, How the Humanities Can Save the Planet, a, a, a modest title. Um, and what you're really going to get in these three lectures um, is just a kind of outline sketch of the beginning of a project um, towards that ambition, because I so much, so strongly share what Gary has said about the importance of the role of the humanities. In the early evening of a stiflingly hot summer's day, although not stiflingly hot by Phoenix standards, this was by Concord, Massachusetts standards, a stiflingly hot summer's day in June 1853, Henry David Thoreau walked to Walden Woods. As he came over the hill, he heard the song of a wood thrush. This is the only bird whose note affects me like music, he writes. Affects the flow and tenor of my thought, my fancy and imag imagination. It lifts and exhilarates me. It is inspiring. It is a medicative draught to my soul. It is an elixir to my eyes and a fountain of youth to all my senses. It changes all hours to an eternal morning. It banishes all trivialness. This minstrel sings in a time, a heroic age, with which no event in the village can be contemporary. How can they be contemporary when the latter is temporary at all? How can the infinite and eternal be contemporary with the finite and temporary? I long for wildness, a nature I cannot put my foot through. Woods, where the wood thrush forever sing, where the hours are early morning ones and there is dew on the grass and the day is forever unclean, where I might have a fertile unknown for a soil about me. All that was ripest and fairest in the wilderness and the wild man is preserved and transmitted in the strain of the wood thrush. It is the mediator between barbarism and civilization. Exactly 100 years after Thoreau heard the wood thrush, a group of scientists from the US Fish and Wildlife Service published an article in the Journal of Wildlife Management entitled, The Effects of DDT Upon the Survival and Growth of Nestling Songbirds. And they compared the fledgling success rate of wood thrush, wrens, and other species in areas that had been sprayed with the pesticide DDT and those that had not. In the unsprayed areas, 86% of fledglings survived to maturity, as against a mere 28% where there was the presence of DDT. Five years after this, in January 1958, a woman named Olga Owens Huckins wrote a letter to the Boston Herald regarding the death of birds around her property 
as a result of aerial spraying of DDT to kill mosquitoes. She sent a copy of the letter to a friend of hers called Rachel Carson, who was inspired to begin her own research into the environmental effects of chemical pesticides. Despite encountering major resistance and obstruction from the chemical industry, which was as adept as the tobacco manufacturers in spreading disinformation, she got to the truth and in 1962 published Silent Spring, the indictment of DDT and other toxic chemicals that is widely credited as inaugurating the modern environmental movement. The book began not with scientific data that, in all its devastating detail, would come in subsequent chapters, but with a narrative, a story. Carson called it a fable for tomorrow. It begins with a pastoral idyll of middle America. There was once a town in the heart of America where all life seemed to live in harmony with its surroundings. The town lay in the midst of a checkerboard of prosperous farms with fields of grain and hillsides of orchards, where in spring white clouds of bloom drifted above the green field. In autumn, oak and maple and birch set up a blaze of color that flamed and flickered across a backdrop of pine. Then foxes barked in the hills and deer silently crossed the fields, half hidden in the mists of the fall morning. Wildflowers by the roadside birds feeding off winter berries, and the seed heads of dried weeds rising above the snow, pools and streams well stocked with trout, a flood of aerial migrants in the spring sky. But then a strange blight crept over the area and everything began to change. Some evil spell had settled on the community. Mysterious maladies swept the flocks of chicken. The cattle and sheep sickened and died. Everywhere was a shadow of death. The farmers spoke of much illness among their families. In the town, the doctors had become more and more puzzled by new kinds of sickness appearing among their patients. There had been several sudden and unexplained deaths, not only among adults, but even among children, who would be stricken suddenly while at play and die within a few hours. There was a strange stillness. The birds, for example, where had they gone? Many people spoke of them, puzzled and disturbed. The feeding stations in the backyards were deserted. The few birds seen anywhere were moribund. They trembled violently and could not fly. It was a spring without voices. On the mornings that had once throbbed with the dawn chorus of robins, catbirds, doves, jays, wrens, and scores of other bird voices, there was now no sound. Only silence lay over the fields and woods and marshes. Chicks no longer hatched, piglets were all runts. There were no bees, no pollination of the apple trees, no fruit. And the cause? No witchcraft, no enemy action had silenced the rebirth of new life in the stricken world. The people had done it themselves. Carson went on to explain that there was not really, in 1962, a single town like this, but that every detail she had enumerated and brought together was based on an environmental blight that had happened somewhere in America. The prospect of a silent spring was real. The effect of her book is well known to historians of the environmental movement. A CBS documentary the following spring brought her argument to millions, and then her testimony before President Kennedy's Science Advisory Committee, even as she was dying of cancer, played a significant role in shifting government policy, which eventually saw the banning of DDT and one of Richard Nixon's more positive legacies, the foundation of the Environmental Protection Agency. DDT might have led to the extinction of the wood thrush. Imagine what Thoreau would have thought of that. In our time, the future of the species is far from assured. Numbers have halved since Rachel Carson's time due to the depredations of domestic and feral cats to loss of woodland. Think for a moment about that image of a silent spring. Rachel Carson got it from a poem by John Keats, a poem called La Belle Dame Sans Merci, which imagines a time, a place where a kind of witchcraft has led to the sedge being withered from the lake and no birds sing. The romantic poets, John Keats writing about the nightingale, P.B. Shelley writing about the skylark, wrote with a directness and a freshness and a love as no one had ever written before about birds. 
and the legacy of that poetry, the shaping power of the romantic image of birdsong, ran through the decades, through the centuries, and inspired Rachel Carson to her title and her initial image. Carson says later in her book that the history of life on Earth has been a history of interaction between living things and their environment. To a large extent, the physical form and the habits of the Earth's vegetation and its animal life have been molded by the environment. Considering the whole span of earthly time, the opposite effect in which life actually modifies its surroundings has been relatively slight. Only within the moment of time represented by the present century has one species, man, acquired significant power to alter the nature of his world. What I want to do in these three lectures is think about time in relation to our relation to the environment. I want to think about the past, I want to think about the future, and I want to end by thinking about the present. I want to think about how the sense of a fall or rupture between human society and nature began, when it began. I want in the second lecture to think about images of ending, images of environmental apocalypse, of catastrophe, the kind of thing that Gary is saying may happen within 50 or 100 years. And then in the third lecture, I want to think a bit about what we can do in the present, how that can be informed by the humanities. I think that the romantic poets are a particularly important group of writers in helping us to develop these ideas. And this was really where my work on literature and the environment began. It began uh, with me as a scholar of William Wordsworth back in the 1980s, early 1990s, feeling that the way in which scholars were writing and teaching about romanticism was losing sight of some of the essentials of Wordsworth. The fact is daffodils, mountains, and childhood are the essentials of Wordsworth. My heart leaps up when I behold a rainbow in the sky, he wrote. And the child is father of the man. I could wish my days to be bound each to each by natural poverty. Wordsworth's new vision, both of the importance of childhood and the memory of childhood, but also, above all, his new vision of an integration between humankind and environment, had an enormous influence on the 19th century, an influence on those foundational transcendentalist writers in America, Emerson, Thoreau himself, Whitman. A huge influence, too, on John Muir, whom I'll talk a little bit about in my third lecture. If we look again at the passage of Thoreau with which I began, you find it's steeped in the language of romanticism. He says of that song thrush, wood thrush, this is the only bird whose note affects me like music, a romantic idea of an analogy between the music of bird song and human music. It affects the flow and tenor of my thought, my fancy and imagination key romantic term, especially imagination. It lifts and exhilarates me, the romantic notion of a moment, whether it's a moment of response to nature or a moment in a work of art that lifts, inspires the spirit. A med medicative draft, the notion of poetry, of literature as a form of medicine for the soul. It is an elixir, the idea of a transformation, elixir to my eyes and a transformation of all the senses. It's associated with an eternal morning, a new dawn. But it also brings back the memory of a past, a better age, a heroic age. Samuel Taylor Coleridge once talked about poetic symbols being, a tra being the translucence of the infinite and the eternal in the temporal. And this is what Thoreau finds in the Song of the Thrush, the infinite and eternal. He contrasts it with the triviality of the temporal, of everyday time. He longs for wildness, for an untamed nature that he cannot put his foot through, for the unknown, for the wilderness, for the wild man. He sees in the Song of the Thrush a mediation between barbarism and civilization. Just as John Keats, writing his Ode to the Nightingale, makes the point that the Song of the Nightingale is the same song that was heard by Ruth in the Old Testament of the Bible, the same song that was heard in classical antiquity. The idea that somehow the natural world can provide us a continuity through time. 
In essence, then, the romantics and Thoreau here are setting up a kind of then and now, before and after model. They look to an idea of wilderness, a word that goes back to a notion of a wild, uninhabited or uncultivated place associated with, with wild deer. In contrast to civilization, which is, of course, a word that comes from the Latin words to do with the city, civilis, civil, civis, a citizen, civitas, a city. The abstract term civilization, interestingly, only emerges in the Enlightenment of the 18th century. That moment of kind of cosmopolitan optimism, a belief that humankind was totally in control of nature and of the world. So a, cl a, a classic Scottish Enlightenment philosopher, Adam Ferguson, writing uh, in his essay on the history of civil society, not only the individual advances from infancy to manhood, but the species itself from rudeness to civilization, that great image of progress, which was the key to the Enlightenment. But even in the Enlightenment, there were counter voices expressing anxiety about progress. One of the key voices of that sort was Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who in the middle of the 1750s entered an essay competition uh, set by the Academy of Dijon uh, to answer the question, what was the origin of inequality in humans? And what Rousseau says is inequality begins with property and with agriculture. The moment, he says, a man encloses a piece of land and says that it is mine, that is when inequality begins. Because then cultivation begins, and once you have cultivation, you have inequality of property, you begin to have trade, you have a transition from, as an anthropologist would put it, a hunter-gatherer culture to um, an, an agriculture. And so it is that Rousseau looks back and idealizes the wild man, as Thoreau calls him. The noble savage uh, was the term that was much used. In a way, of course, it is a myth, the idea that somehow uh, the, that we would all be happier if we were hunter-gatherers living off berries in the, in, in the forest. But it's, a, it's an exceptionally powerful myth. It's one that I think is one of our keys to this idea of before and after, which is what I want to talk about today. Here's a, an image also from the Romantic period, uh, the great uh, Hudson Valley, um, Hudson River artist, Th Th Thomas Cole, the kind of key Romantic artist in America. Um, it's his famous uh, picture of the oxbow, and it gives us exactly that image of before and after. On the one side, you have a wild, a wilderness, an untamed landscape. On the other side, you have a cultivated agricultural landscape. You have a kind of line down the middle. And um, I've highlighted for you here, you have a little self-portrait of Thomas Cole um, down there with his easel. Um, and which way does he look? That's the question he's asking, because surely the Oxford itself looks like a question mark. Does the artist owe loyalty to the preservation of this? Or must the artist reflect this? Or is the place of art somehow to be a mediator between this and that, between then and now? As I say, that idea of the noble savage, of there being a, a time and a kind of person who is one with nature, was uh, an immensely powerful thought uh, that, that Rousseau developed. Um, and uh, not so long after he died, when um, a, a feral child, a wild boy, was discovered in the woods of Avaron. Um, a book was published about, about him, idealizing him as a kind of noble savage, an historical account of the discovery and education of a savage man found in the woods near Avaron. This became a very influential text, influential on all, all sorts of authors and on culture more widely. And that idea that somehow the image of the noble savage is, is there as an admonition to us, an admonition to our society. Remember Thoreau's point about barbarism and civilization. We think we're the civilized ones, they are the barbarians. But actually, could it be the other way around? Rousseau says whether or not his idea is historically accurate doesn't really matter. The point is to offer a critique of the present. And if we then think about the way that within the environmental movement, a kind of idealization of indigenous people 
functions. It is in precisely that way. It's the last survivor of an uncontacted tribe deep in the Amazon, caught recently on film. Why was he the last survivor? Because all the other members of his tribe were killed by loggers when they went into that part of the Amazon and cleared the forest. So, when does all this begin? I'm suggesting there is a fall from our relationship to nature. When does it begin? This is a, a very famous um, graph that was uh, a chart that was originally uh, put together uh, just after the year 2000 and then updated subsequently. Um, Earth system trend over the last two and a half centuries. And what it shows is terrestrial biosphere degradation, the amount of land that is domesticated, the loss of tropical forests, proportion of coastal nitrogen, shrimp aqu aquaculture, marine fish capture, ocean acidification, temperature rising, ozone depletion, methane in the atmosphere, nitrous oxide. And what one clearly sees is a spike beginning with the Industrial Revolution increasing through the mid-19th century as industrialization becomes global, and then this huge upward curve through the 20th century, becoming ever steeper after 1945, the great acceleration. It's figures like this um, that have led geologists to name our current era the Anthropocene, the era of human influence upon the environment. Now, once I show a, a graph like that, you begin to say, well, hang on, you're talking about science here. What is the role of the humanities in this? But what I'm trying to suggest in the course of these lectures is that, of course, we need the sciences to provide us with empirically evidenced explanation of phenomena such as climate change. It's the scientists who produce the evidence that allow us to see charts like that. Of course, too, we need technologies, innovations that can provide fixes of one kind or of another to our environmental problems. And we need the social scientists to offer economic and political arguments for change, to influence governments, inter, in, intergovernmental organizations, NGOs, to influence corporations, local administration. But we also need the humanities because we need narratives on a human scale of time and place. And we need an emotional and a personalized engagement. Geological time and planetary scale are hard for lay people to comprehend. For many people, perhaps for children beginning to learn about the environment in school, a chart such as that does not speak as powerfully as images and stories might speak. A picture speaks a thousand words. It's often said that Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, is the, uh, the foundation of the modern environmental movement, but it's sometimes also said that the famous photograph taken by an Apollo 8 astronaut on Christmas Eve 1968, in which for the first time in human history, the Earth was seen from space, from the, the contrast between the surface of the moon and the ocean blue of the Earth was an enormously influential image that sparked so much thinking about the nature of our extraordinarily beautiful, extraordinarily fragile planet. So when did the Anthropocene begin? There was a great debate among geologists, climate scientists, and others about this. Uh, the notion was first uh, disseminated widely um, in 2000 by, by the scholars Kratz and Sturmer, who argue 
or the Industrial Revolution. Exactly that period when the Romantic writers are beginning to notice a change in the atmosphere, a change in urbanization because of industrialization, because of, above all, the invention of the steam engine. Thus, Crutzen and Sturmer. To assign a more specific date to the onset of the Anthropocene seems somewhat arbitrary, but we propose the latter part of the 18th century, although we are aware that alternative proposals can be made. Some may even want to in include the entire Holocene, the Holocene in our current era. However, we choose this date because during the past two centuries, the global effects of human activities have become clearly noticeable. This is the period when data retrieved from glacial ice cores ice cores show the beginning of a growth in the atmospheric concentrations of several greenhouse gases, particularly CO2 and CH4. Such a starting date also coincides with James Watt's invention of the steam engine in 1784. The counter-argument is that humankind has been shaping the environment for much, much longer. Thus, a few years later, William Ruderman countering argument uh, in the journal Climate Change, uh, an article called The Anthropogenic Greenhouse Era began thousands of years ago. The abstract of the article, the anthropogenic era is generally thought to have begun 150 to 200 years ago when the Industrial Revolution began producing CO2 and CH4 at rates sufficient to alter their composition of the atmosphere. A diff different hypothesis is posed here. Anthropogenic emissions of these gases first altered atmospheric concentrations thousands of years ago. Three arguments. Cyclic variations driven by Earth orbital changes decrease, uh, predict decreases throughout the Holocene, but the CO2 trend began an anomalous increase 8,000 years ago, and the CH4 trend 5,000 years ago. Two published explanations based on natural forcing can be rejected because of the paleoclimatic evidence, and three, a wide array of archaeological, cultural, historical, and geologic evidence pointing to viable explanations tied to anthropogenic changes resulting from early agriculture in Eurasia, including the start of forest clearance by 8,000 years ago and of rice irrigation by 5,000 years ago. So was it agriculture? Was it industry? Well, of course, in many senses, it's both. And in a way, it's immaterial to my argument um, as to whether the geologists eventually have some kind of conference where they announce when the Anthropocene began. But the point is that both those changes, the, the changes that come from the beginnings of agriculture with all that follows from it, particularly deforestation, soil erosion, and the, the effects of overgrazing, or alternatively, industrialization, urbanization. So how do we in the humanities start talking about the Anthropocene? Well, if we see it beginning with the Industrial Revolution, then we see the corresponding cultural development as Romanticism, which is a counter to an admonition against what happens with the Industrial Revolution. If we believe the Anthropocene begins with agriculture, then all cultural production, going back to the earliest surviving literature and artworks, becomes relevant. And it's significant in that regard that the very word culture emerges from agriculture. But either way, what the humanities can offer is a narrative of the onset of the destructive human impact on the environment, a narrative of origin or beginning. Now, all cultures have narratives of origin, and most of them involve some form of fall or rupture. Humanities discipline have been studying those narratives of origins for centuries. But what I want to suggest is that what we need to do in our century is reconsider them from the point of view of our current environmental crisis, to read them as narratives of our fall from a state of integration with nature. In a famous essay called The Use and Abuse of History, the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche argued that the study of history is fruitless unless we apply it to the present. And I would say, apply it to the present and use it beneficially for the future. So how might we think about some of the traditional narratives of fall, origin and fall, from an environmental point of view? 
But if we think about the Greco-Roman tradition, the foundation of Western culture, then I would argue that we might do so by attending more to Hesiod as a foundational author than to Homer. Our traditional stories that we teach our students are to do with the literature of classical antiquity, beginning with the story of war, Homer's Iliad, and the story of family, travel, and homecoming, Homer's Odyssey. But sometime after Homer, the writer Hesiod, in his works and days, told a different story of origins, laid a different foundation. And it was a foundation that took an image of there being five ages, ages through which we fall towards the present. The idea was taken up by many later Greek and Roman authors, and most famously by Ovid at the beginning of his great collection of the myths of classical antiquity, the Metamorphoses, where he talks about the four ages of humankind, the golden age, the silver, the brazen, and the iron. And his image of the golden age was immensely influential. It is an age of sustainability, self-sustainability of the earth. Then of her own accord, the earth produced a store of every fruit. The harrow touched her not, nor did the plowshare wound her fields. Already a recognition there of the destructive effect of agriculture. And man, content with given food and none compelling, gathered uh, I don't know what that word our, our boot is. <laughs> uh, that must be a typo, uh, uh, it, because I think it should be uh, arboreal. Yeah. Gathered arboreal fruits and wild strawberries on the mountain sides, and ripe blackberries clinging to the bush and corners, and sweet acorns on the ground, down fallen from a spreading tree of Joe. Image of vegetarianism there. No, no meat eating. Eternal spring, soft-breathing zephyrs, soothed and warmly cherished buds and blooms produced without a seed. The valleys, though unplowed, gave many fruits. The fields, though not renewed, white glistened with the heavy bearded wheat. Rivers flowed milk and nectar. And the trees, the very oak trees, then gave honey of themselves. An idealization that proved an immensely powerful image for hundreds, if not indeed thousands, of years. The idea of the golden age lays the basis for the pastoral tradition. We see it in the Greek poet Theocritus, we see it above all in the eclogues of Virgil, and then of course we see it in the Renaissance tradition of pastoral. If one thinks of Shakespeare's play as you like it, the idea of a corrupt court is contrasted to the pastoral world of the forest of Arden, a world that Shakespeare knew well, because of course he was brought up in Stratford-upon-Avon on the edge of the forest of Arden. The history of forests, forest as wilderness, the history of forest management is an immensely important part of the story. And I'll, I'll talk a bit more about forests um, in my later lecture. Thomas Cole, who we saw with that image um, of the Oxbow, uh, also produced a, a classic, a, a sort of typical image of the Arcadian or pastoral state, the idea of a perfect place where humankind is integrated with nature is not harming nature. I pulled this uh, from a, a local real estate website. <laughs> the name Arcadia is rooted in ancient Greek history. It is a region and also part of its mythology. Arcadia was home to one of the Greek gods and symbolizes unspoiled harmonious wilderness. Aptly named Arcadia in Phoenix in the 85018 code, <laughs> Arizona is truly in harmony with nature. There's majestic camelback mountain views, water weaving in and out from the Arizona Canal. Hang on, the canal? Is that entirely natural? <laughs> and an abundance of fruit trees. Yeah, not to mention a few palm trees that don't actually belong here. In the early 1920s, land to the south of majestic camelback mountain went up for sale at 35 cents an acre, mostly sold in five-acre parcels of citrus orchards. That is after the Arcadia Water Company began irrigating, though the history of irrigation and its harms is again a big part of our story. Today, Arcadia residents enjoy a well-meshed neighborhood of spacious, architecturally interesting homes and the lush remnants of the area's rural past. Brackets, though you won't get one for less than about a million and a half dollars. Arcadia. 
So much for the classical tradition. What about the Judeo-Christian tradition? Genesis chapter 2. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant for sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and keep it. Again, the history of gardens, uh, a fascinating, fascinating story. The garden is the supreme example of nature cultivated by humankind, but stewarded, looked after with care, with love. The Garden of Eden, one of our foundational myths. However, that of course comes from the second creation myth in the book of Genesis. You know, the famous fact of the book of Genesis written by two different scribes having two different stories of creation. And in the first creation story, there's a different kind of narrative. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he a male and female created he them. And God blessed them and said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over everything, every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be the meat. So the Judeo-Christian tradition offers two strikingly contrasting narratives of origin. One, a narrative of dominion, of command, the idea that everything on earth, all living things, all vegetation is here solely to serve us, for us to command, for us to name, consume. And then secondly, in the second narrative, that much gentler, more productive image of the garden and of stewardship. In a very influential essay written in um, Science magazine in 1967, uh, Lynn White, uh, talking about the historical roots of our ecological crisis, pointed the finger firmly at Christianity. Especially in its Western form, Christianity is the most anthropocentric religion the world has seen. As early as the second century, both Tertullian and St. Irenaeus of Lyon were insisting that when God shaped Adam, he was foreshadowing the image of the incarnate Christ, the second Adam. Man shares in great measure God's transcendence of nature. Christianity, in absolute contrast to ancient paganism and to Asia's religions, except perhaps Zoroastrianism, not only established a dualism of man and nature, but also insisted that it is God's will that man exploit nature for its proper end. So there's a very interesting debate among theologians and believers between those, those two different traditions. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, part of the argument against the worshipping of idols. Remember, among the Ten Commandments is the idea of not worshipping graven images. Part of the argument against that is an argument against what I would call animism. Take ye therefore good heed unto yourselves, for ye saw no manner of similitude on the day the Lord spake unto you in horror out of the midst of the fire. Remember, Yahweh, the Jewish God, has no physical form. It's a, kind of, it's a voice in the fire lest ye corrupt yourselves and make you a graven image, the similitude of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any beast that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged fowl that flieth in the air, the likeness of anything that creepeth on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the waters that beneath the earth. And lest thou lift up thine eyes unto heaven, and when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, even all the hosts of the heaven, should be driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord God hath divided unto all nations under the whole heaven. So the worship of the elements of the sun, the moon, the stars, of any living thing, anything upon the earth, is condemned at that point in the Bible. And that's a tradition of um, hostility to animism, to the idea of a kind of divinity in nature that became more extreme with Protestantism 
the greatest of all English Protestant poets, John Milton, one of his early poems on the morning of Christ's nativity, um, celebrates the death of what I would call the genius loci, the spirits of places, those kinds of gods and goddesses of rivers and trees and lakes, which Ovid's Metamorphoses is so full of. The lonely mountains are on the resounding shore a voice of weeping heard and loud lament. For a haunted spring and dale edged with poplar pale, the parting genius is with sighing scent, with flower in woven tresses torn, the nymphs in twilight shade of tangled thickets mourn. Milton, the poet, is rather sorry to see them going, these beautiful poetic nature spirits. But Milton, the theologian, the, the, the Protestant, knows that they must go. In consecrated earth and on the holy hearth, the Lars and Lemures, the, the Lars, the, the, the Lares, the spirits of place, moan with midnight plaint in urns and altars round. A drear and dying sound affrights the flamens at their service quaint, and the chill marble seems to sweat, while each peculiar power forgoes his wanted seat. The loss of the peculiar powers, the specific powers associated with places, is a part of the Christian story. Big contrast uh, to Eastern traditions in particular, if you think of the Shinto tradition in Japan, where there is a notion of the sacredness of particular places. I was struck too uh, in the Phoenix Art Museum uh, la last week in the, in the great uh, Teotihuacan exhibition, um, some of the figures there, but all Mesoamerican ancient cultures ha do have images of natural gods, the storm god, the fire god, the water goddess, the feathered serpent, the netted jaguar, and so on. However, riding to the rescue of this, we, we have the green pope. Um, pope Francis, uh, who very deliberately, very consciously, took the name of Francis. Francis who represents, St. Francis who represents that stewardship tradition as opposed to that dominion tradition. In his second encyclical, Laudato Si, uh, which is an allusion to the great hymn of St. Francis, um, he produces a really, really powerful ecological manifesto. And again, I'll be talking about this more in the, 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 the third lecture. But it's, a, it's an extraordinary piece of writing, although it does have one great flaw, which again, I'll, I'll, I'll hold back for the third lecture. But this is uh, Pope Francis's view of uh, the creation account. And he's really very much focusing on that second uh, account here, although um, he, he, he tries to recuperate the first one as well. The creation accounts in the book of Genesis contain in their own symbolic and narrative language profound teachings about human existence and its historical reality. They suggest that human life is grounded in three fundamental and closely intertwined relationships with God, with our neighbor, and with the earth itself. According to the Bible, these three vital relationships have been broken both outwardly and within us. There's that idea of fall or rupture. The rupture is sin. The harmony between the creator, humanity, and creation as a whole was disrupted by our presuming to take the place of God and refusing to acknowledge our creaturely limitation. This in turn distorted our mandate to have dominion over the earth, to till it and to keep it. As a result, the originally harmonious relationship between human beings and nature became conflictual it is significant that the harmony which St. Francis of Assisi experienced with all creature was seen as a healing of that rupture. St. Bonaventure held that through universal reconciliation with every creature, St. Francis in some way returned to the state of original innocence. Here's our friend Thomas Cole, again, uh, the expulsion from the Garden of Eden. And I've just circled Adam and Eve in this because what he shows so powerfully in the expulsion is the sense of the smallness of humankind. What hubris it is to imagine that we have dominion over the whole of nature. We do not have dominion over those mountains and waterfalls, which are, of course, very much um, in a genre, both of romantic art and of Cole's own uh, delighted representation of mountains and waterfalls um, in, in the Catskills and along the Hudson. Cole, I think, is an absolutely fascinating figure. I don't know if anybody, any of you managed to, to, to see the fantastic exhibition of his work, which was on the Metropolitan uh, in New York last year. Um, at the center of that um, was uh, his astonishing um, series of five huge um, canvases showing the progress of empire. 
And this is a version of that story of decline, that story of the ages that goes back to Ovid, goes back to Hesiod. So here we have the first stage, uh, the stage of um, the, the state of nature, uh, the hunter-gatherer state. And the, the, the image is essentially the same. You'll see that, that um, mountain here uh, recurs, uh, and, and the sea behind recurs in each of the five images. So that's stage one. Stage two is the pastoral, which we've, we've already seen, the, that, that, that golden, golden age. And uh, you, can, you can see uh, the, the shepherd there working his flock. But then comes empire. So you've still got the, uh, the rock there and the sea, but you have a mighty city. But Cole knew that all empires fall, that dominion eventually leads to destruction. And this is his image of war, destruction, the end of empire. And then you're left with ruin, with a kind of return to nature. Perhaps an allegory of what our world might look like 100, 200, 300 years from now. A reclamation in which the rock, the water, the earth repossesses as empire is ruined. The role of empire in the history of environmental destruction is absolutely central and will be something that I'll again be talking about next week. So what I've tried to suggest um, through this kind of lightning sketch of images of the fall is that by re-examining these narratives in environmental terms, all the different humanities disciplines can come together. We talked a bit about the importance of that moment of the Industrial Revolution, the changes that came with that. This is something that historians teach about. We've looked at the romanticism of Wordsworth, the transcendentalism of Thoreau, their reaction against the Industrial Revolution. This is something that literary scholars work on. We've talked a bit about Rousseau's theory of origins, the theory of the origin of inequality of a noble savage. Rousseau, a philosopher. We've looked at those classical stories of origins and of Arcadia, classicists come to the table. We've, we've gone from Genesis to the Pope. There is the role of the theologian. We've looked briefly at the different kinds of narrative of divinity and nature in Mesoamerica. This is where the archaeologist and anthropologist comes into play. And we've looked at Thomas Cole's image of the declining ages. And that is where the art historian has a role to play. But it's not just the high art of the past, the history of the distant past, the archaeology, the anthropology. Cultural studies, the study of popular culture also has a role to play. And music too. Just sit back for a few minutes and listen to a song. Thank you very much. One question I did have, and then I just before that, I want to have a, a I have a comment. Um, your comment about what humanities add to the sustainability initiative, like what we're trying to accomplish with it, and what it brings and is missing, as a, a humanities person myself, as well as a social scientist, seeing those two worlds of the narratives is incredible, and the emotive response that I just had in that very end segment that you played for us um, is testament just to how powerful that images, words, um, music, how these pieces come together to really tell that story. So thank you for that. I'm really kind of uh, demonstrating that for us. And so my question is, what is exactly your, what you plan to be doing during your residency here? Because I'm more interested to learn a little bit about your work other than these lecture series. Yeah, no, but thank, thank, you. thank you very much for asking that. Uh, I think the answer is, 
I'm, I'm here, obviously, to give the lectures, uh, but primarily to learn. I mean, the, 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 the two, well, there's three, three things, really, um, other, other than these lectures. One is um, I'm co-teaching with Marc Lucier um, a course um, on environmental literature, film, and theory, um, because I wanted to get a sense of um, how your students, the next generation, how they are thinking about these issues, what they can bring to these kinds of discussions. Um, so uh, just having a classroom experience, um, just seeing, for example, I mean, this, just yesterday I was teaching Thoreau uh, Walden, uh, just seeing whether Thoreau's vision, I went to the, the woods to live deliberately, to front only the essential facts of life, uh, to suck the marrow out of life, whether Thoreau's vision still speaks to people in the 21st century. Um, so that's one thing. Um, the second thing is um, I'm doing some work here um, together with my wife, Paula Byrne, um, it, which is uh, to do with a, a slightly different but, but related initiative. Um, we've um, established in England a small charitable foundation devoted to the mental health and well-being benefits of the arts and especially of poetry. Um, and Paul and I are, uh, are involved in various projects, which Mark uh, Lucier and some of his colleagues are also involved in. Um, because I, and what interests me there is I firmly believe that um, planetary health and human health go together. Uh, and indeed, Thoreau believed exactly, exactly the same thing. So I want to explore those connections. Um, and um, we're doing some work with the Mayo Clinic um, around, around that. And then the third thing is just simply to find out more about what is going on in the Global Institute of Sustainability and at ASU generally, because there, there is no doubt that um, the, the sustainability has a kind of centrality um, and a sort of transdisciplinary reach here at ASU that as far as I'm aware, it does not have at any other university in the world. So I'm really here you know, to learn from all of you uh, to learn from students, to begin to think about, as I say, a, a, a dialogue between environmental humanities and medical humanities, between planetary health and human health. Um, but also, uh, it gives me a chance to get away from my day job that involves a lot of administration and boring bureaucracy and stuff, and just have some time in this fascinating city uh, and have some time to start writing a book that I hope will emerge for, for, from all this. Uh, and the other thing that I, 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 I suppose I'm, I'm particularly interested in is the fact um, of Phoenix, which is in arguably one of the least sustainable cities on the planet, <laughs> having the Institute of Sustainability here. Um, I've been reading a um, fascinating book by Andrew Ross, the social scientist, who I think had, had a residency here. He's, you, he certainly cites your, your work and your, your institute in it, uh, a book called Bird on Fire, which is about the history of the development of Phoenix and issues around land and water um, uh, you know, because, because of your son here, uh, you, the, the potential that you have for the use of renewables is extraordinary, but equally because of the desert, because of the issue of water, because of you know, the cost of air conditioning, of cars, transport, and all that, uh, Phoenix, it seems to me, in some ways, is um, it's the kind of do-or-die place. It is it's, 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 it's an, it's, it's the, the place where there is hope, but it's also the place where catastrophe may come soon. Mm. Hi, hi, Professor Wei, and I'm Wei Wei, and a joint PhD student from Shanghai Tongjing University and ISU here. Welcome, okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. and um, I think the speech, the title of this speech, the first speech is, uh, I think it's from East and West. I was very impressed by this, and it reminds me about a sentence that you wrote on some of us. Uh, it is uh, what is uh, material and earthy mm. is language, not ground. What is cultivated is uh, taste, not crops, right? Mm. So, uh, actually, my question is: since we, you know, the eastern country like China, and the west country like America, hold different cultural background like culture ties here, and have you ever uh, think about, uh, you know, maybe? If there has any possibilities to construct those kind of common theoretical background to parallel those kind of international environmental humanity practices, mm. and also secondly, a very simple question here: and uh, have you ever? Uh, I think, what's your opinion? 
What's your opinion about the transnational turn of eco-criticism nowadays in the age of Anthropocene? Mm. Okay, that's it. Uh, second question, a very, very, very big one. Just, just coming back to the first one, I, um, without wishing to kind of, for those of you who are going to come back, who haven't been put off by the first one, uh, I, without get, giving away what I'm going to be saying in my, my third lecture, which is about models for the present, model, models of sustainable living, um, what I'm going to do in that lecture is I'm very much going to be looking to Eastern traditions. Um, and uh, the, because it seems to me there are, there are very, very powerful traditions, um, for example, in Chinese poetry, classic, classical Chinese poetry, where uh, there is a, an attitude towards being uh, where, that we have a lot to learn from. And this is true of many Eastern religions. I'm, so I'm slightly anticipating my, my third lecture. But what, what I want to, one of the things I want to work from in that lecture is a, a distinction that the philosopher, um, the philosopher of the Frankfurt School, Erich Fromm, made between having and being, a culture of having, of possession, of economic growth, and a culture of being. And it seems to me in thinking about being, for a long time, the West has learnt from the East, but still has much more to learn. Uh, the second part of your question about eco-criticism um, is, a, is a very interesting one. I mean, the word eco-criticism was established in the, in the late 20th century. My, my book on romantic ecology, I, I think, was the first um, British literary critical book to, 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 to use the term, explore the idea. Um, and there's a, uh, there's, a, there's a general view that eco-criticism sort of began in the late 20th century um, with a focus on uh, quite obviously environmental texts. Wordsworth, Thoreau, the Romantic Poets, John Muir, um, the texts that are very clearly about the environment. Um, and some of those classic texts, which in the course I'm teaching with, with Mark, we'll be looking at um, things like Edward Abbey's uh, Desert, Desert Solitaire, um, the works of Terry Tempest Williams, uh, people writing about natural environments and, and that wilderness tradition, which is of great importance. But what, what's happened in eco-criticism more recently um, is an increasing awareness that all cultures, all systems have ecologies, have an environment, and that urban environments uh, are the place where most of us live. And thinking about sustainable urban living, the possibilities for a green living within urban environments is something that eco-criticism is increasingly considering. And I think the other important aspect um, in, in recent years, and um, Joni Adamson uh, has been a, a, a leader in this, is um, a recognition that um, environmental degradation, pollution, always affects the poor more than it does the rich. And therefore, environmental justice is an essential part of our environmental solutions, that we, we shouldn't have some kind of a division between thinking about the problems that have come from uh, globalization, from the vestiges of empire, from uh, global inequality, and environmental problems, because actually the two things go together. But thank you for those questions. Uh <clears throat> I have a question. Um, great talk. Uh, my background is engineering, so I'm going to look at this from a practical point of view. And I'm wondering in your three talks if you are going to try to tackle it. Um, Gary earlier said, you know, he, he put a, a number figure of $100 trillion just on the energy side. 10 billion, or yeah, 10 billion people, 80 million a year by um, 2050. Are you going to look at and explore the narrative that, as an engineer, we can design sustainable systems, adaptive systems, but only for a subset of the whole? So do we design the system for 10 billion and watch it crumble? Or do we design the system for 8 billion saying, yes, we can flourish, but then how do we tell the two billion, you're not welcome, and then how do we tell the eight billion, this is how you need to cope. This is where humanity helps you cope with the fact that two million people didn't get in. Yeah, that's the biggest, toughest question of all, isn't it? A um, uh, couple of thoughts in response to it. Um, 
one is the one of the things that humanities brings is evidence from history. Um, so one of the things I'll I'll I'll, I'll be exploring, uh, begin to explore in the second uh, lecture, is thinking back at that Thomas Cole image of empires that come to an end. What are the things that cause um, cultures, civilizations to destroy themselves? And there are there are there are some famous historical examples of this from which we can from which we can learn. So so there's the element of um, of, of learning from history, learning from the mistakes of history. Um, and this is, this is something, as, as I think, as we look around the world today, that um, the, our, our memories are short, but there are a lot of historical mistakes from which we can learn. And as a, as a general rule, uh, historically, it's a big generalization, local solutions tend to work the attempt to impose large-scale solutions often actually end up making the problem worse. Um, so one answer to the question is, no, we cannot possibly hope to find a global solution. But if we begin with local solutions, gradually those local so solutions can circle out. And in, in a sense, I mean, that's, that's why... Um, we, you know, that, that's, for example, that, you know, that's why we recycle. It's why, it's why we think about local food and so on. I mean, I'm, uh, and it's amazing what, you know, small, small things can, can, can do. My cousin uh, is a, um, a, a very influential um, uh, environmental um, activist and theorist, uh, advisor to, to Parliament in, in, in Britain. And he, the first intervention that he made was way back in the, the, the late 1970s, um, he started advocating the use of bottle banks. And uh, he worked for uh, the Friends of the Earth organization, published a, a booklet about that. And, and that actually led to the establishment of bottle banks, the recycling of glass um, across, across the UK. A small local intervention that has had a large scale effect. So that's, that's one answer. Um, Another answer is to say that the, the key to what the humanities bring is to do with education. That in the end, we only solve the problem through changes of behavior, changes of consciousness even, through ways of living. And it's behavior, consciousness, that these are things that the humanities study and can influence. So the key it seems to me, is education, that getting sustainability education into high schools, spreading, uh, spreading it across disciplines in colleges and universities. That's an essential part of the story. The other area that I think is where things get really tricky is where you start talking about, as it were, the two billion who don't get in. Um, and that's where um, questions around what is a sustainable population for the, for the planet become, become very complex, very problematic. And of course, this is a problem that precisely goes back to that moment of the Industrial Revolution, the moment of Romanticism. 1798, William Wordsworth publishes his famous poems, The Lyrical Ballads, um, which launched the Romantic movement, the idealization of small communities in the mountains and so on. 1798 also sees Thomas Malthus publishing the essay on population in which he says, Quite simply, population grows exponentially. Food supply does not grow exponentially. There's going to be a problem. But of course, Malthus's solution, let's stop the poor from breeding, was a distinctly problematic one. Now, it, it, and that, that then leads me to, uh, again, anticipating something I was going to say in the third lecture about the Pope, whom I very much admire, the, uh, the big gap the gaping hole in the Pope's ecological manifesto was, of course, contraception. Um, and contraception is a really good example of both a technical fix and a change in human behavior whereby a, a human instinct, a, a human biological urge to copulate and reproduce is never going to go away. But you know, the, the, the advent of contraception has provided a check on population. 
And of course, we're now in this rather extraordinary world where um, in Italy, for example, um, the, the, the average, average birth rate um, per couple is now 0.9, isn't it? So Italy is in a, a, a declining population, and that too brings its problem. So a slightly rambling answer, but a, a huge and important question. I'll do what I can, but I'm, I'm not going to provide you with your, your total engineering fix. <laughs> Well, due to the uh, temporal constraints of our space and our presence here, uh, we're going to have one more question, uh, and uh, then I have to make a, an announcement. Uh. Hi. Oh, sorry. Never been on one of these before. Thank you for your talk and your visit, and I hope you have a great time while you're here. I was going to ask how we reach the heights of inspiration of a Walden or a Thoreau in a world that consumes its literature 140 characters at a time. <laughs> but then you played Don Henley. So <laughs> proceeding from a more inclusive definition of art, um, Avatar, highest grossing movie in history, something like 2.8 billion. Uh, to, I'm not aware of any great flourishing of environmental activity that stemmed from that, besides the director, of course. Um, but if that isn't the type of scale, and you know, uh, just to preface for anybody that hasn't seen it, it has a very strong environmental message, uh, where do we go from there? And that's already reaching so many people. It's a good question. Um, I. I think the, the film I would counter with would be um, Wally, uh, which is uh, you know a, a fantastic film for kids about rubbish um, and waste disposal is 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 a, a massive problem and it it does seem to me that you know the, and that's why I, I talk about influencing consciousness you know get get to the kids because the kids are the future 